17. Welcome to United Methodist Church. We are happy that you are here on this day, Mother's Day. Quite appropriately, I think, that today we have two ro rosebuds on the altar for two new children in our church family. Sherry Lynn, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Harold Ellenberger. Gregory Sean, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Ted Haskell. All of the parents are here today. And I think that we have the unique honor of also having Gregory Sean with us today, less than a week old. We are happy to welcome these new children into our family of faith. In your bulletins, you find the small attendance registration slip. I would ask each of you to fill one of these in. We are happy you are here. We want to know of your presence with us today. When you have filled these in, if you will pass them to the center aisle, the ushers will pick them up. I would remind everyone that this Tuesday evening, we shall be having a special session of the quarterly conference and church conference. 
The main item of business, the announced item of business for that evening is that of determining the future or fate of Old Wesley Hall, the building which sits on the corner of Ankeny and Pleasant. As we have said before, the Methodist Church, now the United Methodist Church, is very democratic when it comes to dealing with property and that a properly called meeting with an announcement of the item of business to be conducted is to be given well ahead of time and everyone 18 years of age or older who is a member of the church has the opportunity of coming and participating in the discussion. Tuesday evening at 7.30. Also in your bulletins this morning you find a duplicate of what you have received in the mail through two letters this week. The form which we are using serve as our pledge card for at this time, in case you have forgotten yours or left it at home, here is a duplicate which you can use for today and that we will be presenting these along with our offering at the close of the service, giving you the opportunity on the form of pledging to the current expense budget, the benevolence budget, and also if you have not previously done so, pledging to the building fund. Again, these are pledges which will run for a period of seven months that we are changing our physical year to the calendar year and we'll be having another campaign, another ever member visitation, a more extensive one in the fall. The Old Testament lesson this morning is a portion of the story of Jonah if you remember, Jonah was given a job to do by the Lord. He was told to go to Nineveh to warn the people to change the directions in which they had been going, to repent and begin to go in a new direction, living differently. Call also, Jonah didn't want to go do this job. He had no particular love, no particular concern for the people of Nineveh. They had done evil he figured that they should get what they deserved. Beginning the story with the 10th verse of the third chapter, immediately following the time when the people of Nineveh did repent and the Lord had decided to do, evil, to, to do good for them instead of evil. When God saw how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and repentest of evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, I beseech thee. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And then Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. And the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm which attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun arose, God appointed a sultry east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Here endeth the reading from the Old Testament. Reading from the New Testament today, a very familiar passage. Reading it from the New Testament in today's English version, version 
recently put out by the American Bible Society, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I may be able to speak the languages of men and even of angels, but if I have not love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. And I may have the gift of inspiring preaching. I may have all knowledge and understand all secrets. And I may have all the faith needed to move mountains. But if I have not love, I am nothing. I may give away everything I have and even give up my body to be burned. But if I have not love, it does me no good. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up. Its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. For our gifts of knowledge and of inspired messages, messages are only partial. But when what is perfect comes, then what is partial disappears. When I was a child, my speech, feelings, and thinking were all those of a child. Now that I am a man, I have no more use for childish ways. What we see now is like the dim image of a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. Meanwhile, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Here endeth the readings from the Old and New Testaments. In your bulletins, inserted half sheet, you find a litany for a festival of the Christian home. We shall use this today as our prayer, just to be used responsively, everyone joining in on the words which are capitalized by leading the other parts, all of us joining together on the last section on the back of the page. Let us thank God for all of his blessings, for the wonders of your creation, for the beauty of the earth, for the order you did bring out of chaos, for life itself. We thank you, o Lord. That within the created order and for your own purpose you did ordain and establish the sacred order of marriage and the family. We that as we have been loved by your Son and have been instructed by your Spirit in the ways of love, both human and divine, that our homes may be built upon our trust in you, that our marriages may be strengthened by bonds eternal, and that our children may be brought up to know you and to love you. And that within our homes, your word may be heard with reverence and appreciation, that your son may reside with us, and that your Holy Spirit may dwell within our hearts. From coldness of heart, from idle talk and gossip, from lack of kindness and sympathy for others, and from the withholding of love. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. From the pursuit of that which is to perish, from selfishness and avarice and self-seeking and vainglory, from preoccupation with the temporal and the trivial. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. From provincialism and narrowness, from a shallow tolerance and a lack of studied conviction, and from poverty of thought and spirit. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. That our homes may be happy, and that therein our children may find security, 
understanding, patience, joy, gentleness, self-control, godliness, and the infinite riches of your grace. That as husbands and wives, we may be as one with our mates, that we may encourage each other in faith and discipleship, and that we may share the dreams, hopes, nobility, and the excitement and adventure of the Christian pilgrimage. That as sons and daughters, we may honor, obey, and revere our parents, that we may build upon the foundations they have laid for us, and that we may never willingly cause them grief or distress, but that we may ever be to them means of joy and grace. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us what we owe you as we forgive what others owe us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. Amen. The hymn is numbered 516. Let us stand. Seymour, the chief character in a story by J.D. Salinger entitled A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, has some kind of nervous breakdown while serving in the armed services. And when Seymour returns to civilian life, he finds it difficult to adjust to the realities which he finds surrounding him. He lives with his wife, but his wife doesn't seem to understand him. At least this is the impression which Seymour has in the day-by-day -day living, the feeling which he has. He has no close friends, and even his family seems to keep him at arm's length. One, one day, however, Seymour goes down to the beach and meets a young girl, and the girl accepts him. And while they search for banana fish, she admires his knowledge and his abilities. Soon the girl has to go home and Seymour has to return to the adult world. And suddenly he cannot face it. His wife is waiting for him, but somehow she really isn't his wife. She's more of a stranger. 
So quietly he picks up a gun and kills himself. Well, in the story there are no villains, no one is out, obviously, to try to persecute Seymour. And his wife doesn't leave him, but the tragedy of Seymour is simply that no one understands him. No one accepts him as he is. Seymour's world is a world without love, and so he shoots himself. Love or death? Isn't this actually true for a person that either he is surrounded by love, receiving and giving, participating in love, or he dies. The need for love, and the all-important part which it plays in the shaping of human personality and human life is drastically seen in the world of the baby. Let us imagine a world into which a baby is born without love, where a cold, practical nurse picks him up, slaps him about, yanks on his tiny shirt, knots a clean cloth around his middle, pokes a bottle in his mouth and goes about her other business while he screams his hut, hurt, his hate and frustrations. Well, perhaps it's hard to imagine such a world. And yet, babies have been born under either, even worse conditions than these. In many cases, the result literally is death, babies dying for no other reason than the lack of love. Withdraw all love from a human being, and the life which you see begins to shrivel and fade away. It slowly begins to be transformed, the personality changes, and the person reaches the point, many times, the point which Seymour reached, where he just is no longer able to stand it. Just as food is the all-important factor in the development of the body, so likewise love is the all-important factor for the development of human personality. And the power of love, the tremendous power which love has to build a person up, to enable him to blossom out, to become a new person, and this power of love extends even beyond the realm of personalities and affects the person physically. Withdraw the love. And we again see the all-pervading effects, not only within the area of personality, but even within the area of the physical health of the person. But just as each person has a great need to receive love, also equally, each person has a need to give love, to participate in love fully, not only as the recipient, but also as a giver. The story is told of a young orphan girl who had a very poor reputation in an orphanage in which she lived. Nothing she did was right. And everything seemed calculated to annoy not only her teachers and supervisors, but the other children as well. And one day, her roommate told the matron that she had seen the young girl place notes in the branches of a tree which stood in the yard. The matron was delighted, for she thought that maybe here was her opportunity to really get something on this girl and to get rid of her. Well, she rushed out to grab the note out of the tree which had been placed there. And when she read it, she hung her head and silently passed it to the person standing next to her. The girl had simply written, to whoever finds this, I love you. Well, certainly we can look at this and see that the girl in doing this was expressing her own need to receive love. But she was also expressing a desire to give love. And the need to receive love is intertwined with the desire to give love. Perhaps we can say the need to give and the need to receive are simply opposite sides of the same coin. For the person unable to give is also the person unable to receive, and the person unable to receive is also the person <coughs> unable to give love. And in whichever form, the inability becomes visible, still the end result. Without love, the person dies. 
spiritually, psychologically, physically. In the life of Seymour, we see what does happen to a person un unable to find love and to give love. Seymour becomes alone in the world. He feels that he's completely cut off from all other persons about him. Seymour is with his wife, and yet she really isn't his wife. She's not, he's not bound to her, joined to her in a sustaining relationship of love. But rather, Seymour feels that he does stand alone in the world, isolated. Yes, he can be with people, but he is unable to find strengthening, sustaining relationships with persons. You see, love is the marvelous factor which in some miraculous way does join two persons together. As we've said one time before, that all that is necessary for two streams to be joined together is for the paths of the two streams to come together. That then the waters also will come together and become mingled together and joined in as complete a manner as possible. But for men, such a unity is possible only through love. Martin Buber, some years ago, presented to us two phrases which have become classics in presenting the relationships between persons and things. The idea that there are basically two types of relationships. First, an I-it relationship, and second, an I-thou relationship. The I-it relationship is the relationship which I, as a person, have with the objects about me, say, the floor upon which I walk. It is an object which I use for the moment because it serves some purpose for me. And yet it is, a, it is a transitory relationship, a superficial passing relationship, no real involvement for how can you become involved with a floor and a floor involved with you. But the I-thou relationship is the relationship possible between persons. When the other person becomes not just an object, not just a thing for me which I use and dismiss when I am through with that, but rather the relationship in which the other person actually becomes a person for me. And that which makes this relationship possible is love. The relationship which penetrates beneath just the level of glib words, but penetrates to a level of understanding and a level of concern, a level of feeling that the other person is involved in my life and I in his life, the feeling of commitment, the feeling of understanding, the feeling of there being a sustaining, strengthening bond between two persons. Someone tells of there being an old encyclopedia that contained nine pages on the word love and nine lines on the word nuclear. And the same person, the person says that a recent edition of the same encyclopedia, in the recent edition, the proportions are exactly reversed. Nine pages on the word nuclear and nine lines on the word love. And certainly this is something of a commentary on the situation in which modern man finds himself wrapped up in a wrapped up by a technological world increasingly relationships becoming those simply of i it automation computers not a name but a number not a person but a punched card and how easy it is for a man to find himself alone surrounded only by technology surrounded only by things involved only in I-it relationships. See, man was created not simply to live in relation to a world of things, but he was created to live in relationships with persons. As someone has said, one man is not a man at all. And as Helmut Thieliker has put it, the solitary atom is not yet man. He is still not the fulfillment of the creation of man. First woman must be created to be his helper. See, it is Adam and Eve together, an I-thou relationship of persons. Adam and Eve together were the representation of man, not Adam alone. Neither Adam nor Eve alone 
is completely a reality without the other. You see then, love is indispensable. Indispensable for man to really become a man. For a man standing alone is not a complete person, but only as he is joined by love in relationships with other persons does he really become a man. I think that one of the basic affirmations, perhaps the basic affirmation, which we as Christians make, or at least I find this increasingly true for myself, the basic affirmation that the ultimate reality in the world is love. The ultimate reality is love. And thus, if I participate in love myself, receiving and giving, and thus, then thus I am participating in what ultimately is real and what ultimately will triumph. You see, I'm convinced that all the demonstrations which we find in the world of hatred, of cruelty, eventually will pass away and that love alone will endure. If the Apostle Paul is able to say that all of those marvelous things such as prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will pass away and that ultimately love itself is what will endure, then I have no trouble at all affirming that hate and war and destruction and enmity and unconcern and apathy and disunity and prejudice and fear and a host of other things also will pass away. <coughs> that love with faith and hope, but love the greatest of them, alone will be triumphant and alone will endure. Brethren, I want to be participating in that which in the end alone will be triumphant and that which alone in the end will endure. All else destroys and is destroyed, but love alone builds up and endures. One of the most picturesque illustrations of what the refusal to participate in love does for a person is found in the rather amusing story of Jonah. Jonah, as we have said, just could not find it within his heart to have any sympathy or any concern or any love for those people in the city of Nineveh. When the Lord did good for them, this just burned Jonah up. He just couldn't stand it. They had done evil. They deserved to be punished. They deserved to be destroyed. That was it. So Jonah went out to sit alone by himself and sulk and kind of wallow in his hatred and in his frustrations and in his disappointments. But in his disappointment, a ray of hope suddenly appeared. There started growing up a plant to shade his head. And Jonah with this ray of hope felt, ah, I will be able to live a halfway comfortable life now and still hang on to my hatred. And yet just as he was beginning to enjoy the comfort that he was receiving, the Lord sent a worm to start eating away at the plant. And the plant withered and died. The Lord then sent a hot, sultry east wind to beat upon him as the hot sun was beating upon his head. Again, Jonah finally reaches the point which Seymour reaches, standing alone, completely cut off from all relationships with other persons because of his hatred, his inability to love. He finally reaches the point, that point which Seymour reached. He asks and he says that it is better that I die than I live. For the person unable to love, for the person unable to participate in love, giving his concern, replacing his hatreds and prejudices and apathy with an actively concerned life. For such a person, the world becomes a living hell. The person becomes bitter. The person suffers. He is cut off. And for such a person, life finally reaches the point where it's just not worth living. Love or death. Well, what does all this mean for me as I live my life day by day? Something of the implication of all that has been said is found in a legend of a poor mountain boy who lived in a crude mountain cottage. And as the legend goes, each day he would look across the valley up on a mountain across the way 
and see a house which seemed to have golden windows, a house with glittering windows which seemed to be made of gold. And he wished for a house for himself, such as that house with the golden windows. And he kept saying to himself, someday I'll make a trip there to see this house. Well, the day came when he set out early in the morning to go see this house with the golden, marvelous windows. It took him most of the day to get there, down through the valley and up the other mountain. When he finally made it, he came upon nothing more than an old, forsaken cabin, an ugly sight, with many window panes broken out and with the weeds grown up all about him. He thought to himself, certainly this cannot be the house with the glittering golden windows. And then he turned and looked back across the valley. And there on the very spot where his own home stood, he saw a house with glittering golden windows. For the sun had traveled through the sky from the east to the west and now was setting over the mountains to the west. The sun being reflected by the windows of his own house. Well, he then realized that this old abandoned shack where he now stood was the house with the golden windows. He then realized that how foolish it was for him to have had the envy which he had. All the while he had been looking upon a place of ugliness from a distance thinking that it was a place of beauty when in reality the place of beauty and the place of delight was the place at which he had been standing, his own home, the own, his own living you see, we are called upon to, to affirm life, the life which is given to us. Not to affirm or be envious of some distant vision, not to go out chasing something which we think might make us happy. For in reality, in the end, happiness is found by participating in the life in which we find ourselves. Developing relationships of love which are possible for us in the life in which we find ourselves. Not the life which we think we may have tomorrow or the next day or the next day. Not the life which we think we might have in some other place in some other time, some distance away. But rather, happiness and joy is found by affirming the life which we have today in this place and participating and enjoying and developing the relationships of love which are possible within the setting which we find ourselves. For you see, if we cannot find happiness, if we cannot find meaningful, sustaining, I-thou relationships with those in our immediate surroundings, then the chances are that we never will find them. The home is the place where the child learns to love by being loved. Thus, the home is the place where, first of all, we are called upon to give of ourselves, to give of our concern, to give of our love in the relationships of the family. And as we give, we come to find that the house in which our family lives is the house with the golden windows.